So yeah, we're live. Thank you so much for all being here and those that are watching, welcome. And this is our first, so to say, panel of our Global Day of Action, International Children's Global Day of Action. And this is all about the future of education. We've got an amazing panel that is here and that is together. Uh, we are a little off time here, but nonetheless, let's make this amazing and let's talk about the future of education. Now I see, I mean, the COVID-19, the virus, it really changed how we think about education, but we, because online education and homeschooling and uh, schooling on Zoom, all of that was, well, a weird thing or something that not all people preferred. And now we sort of have to live with it and we have to deal with it. So now our perspective on education is changing. And I see a lot of people, especially around me, that are thinking um, about education in a rather different way. And that COVID, I think, really provided us with the perspective. So here we have Kyle Wagner, Peter Hofstrasser, Nyla Malou, and Tom Markham here with us to discuss the future of education. I'd like for one by one to please introduce yourself briefly so all of us can initially know who you are. Let's start with the youngest in the house, Nyla Malou. Hello, Nyla, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm Nyla. I'm a 15 year old. Um, most of my work has been within the environmental sector. So I'm working on building transparent and flexible solar cells in a lab and doing a little bit of research into trying to create a better algae based bioplastic plastic, sorry. Uh, and then I'm also working on a sequel to my novel that was released a few months ago, as well as putting together a children's book series on emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, nanotech, uh, things like that. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. And thank you for having me. Yeah. And I mean, I met with this amazing lady and I fell in love because she was talking about amazing physics and bio stuff. That's what I understood from <laughs> Uh, when we met. Kyle Wagner, please go ahead with your brief introduction. Uh, okay, that's a very hard introduction to follow. Nyla, you're 15 and you, I think you've done more than I've done. I won't reveal my age, <laughs> but it's older than you are. Um, yeah, so I'm Kyle. I am over here in Hong Kong, um, primarily really helping schools, I think, really make the transition. Uh, we've been talking about this for quite a long time in terms of the innovations that are necessary in education. I think Nyla and Rahid are living proof of what happens when you empower uh, kids to you know, take control of their own learning. I primarily work around the field of project-based learning. Um, got my start in high tech high in San Diego, which probably a lot of people have heard of. And it's led me now internationally um, to work with schools on uh, all different parts of the globe and really helping teachers make the transition to really student-centered learning and primarily doing that through project-based experiences. I'm sure Nyla will have three or four books by the time she's my age, but I have one, and that is uh, Power of Simple, and it's really offering some common sense types of strategies to make those transitions and shifts. Um, so that's me. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much for being here. It's such an honor to have you on. Sir Song Markham, please, your brief introduction. So happy to have you here. You're on mute, Tom. Uh, thank you, Raheen. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm Tom Markham. I'm um, sitting here in California this morning. Um, I have been actually working on the future of education for 30 years, and I'm glad to say I think it might actually be here. Uh, that's the, probably why we're having uh, conversations like this, and I'm anxious to get into what that means, what that conversation looks like. Uh, my journey has been from teacher, classroom teacher, to founder of an organization called PBL Global. Uh, in that capacity, actually, Kyle and I, I have worked together. We work in the same field. Uh, I'm also a psychologist, so I'm interested in uh, social emotional strengths and the personal qualities that are explored as people go forward in education, which actually I think are going to be far more important than the actual curriculum we deliver. It's going to be the ability of people to manage themselves through what I see as somewhat of a chaotic future. And I have uh, a book that is actually is not that well known, but is actually my best book, I think. It's called Redefining Smart. And that's really 
about how we awaken ourselves to become different kind of learners in this world. So uh, I'm very happy to be here and happy to join. So thank you, Rahim. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. It's an amazing uh, sort of interaction that we had. And it's so nice to have it again with you all yet discussing the entire group. Now, Peter Hostra, so so nice. It's so nice to have you here. It's so amazing. Please introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Peter Hostrasser. Uh, I've been in education for 20 years as a secondary educator. Um, I'm a two-time entrepreneur, uh, one big failure uh, learning moment. And then uh, right now, um, I co-founded Hall Pass Education, which is a think tank around education uh, with two of my co-founders, um, Dr. Peter James uh, and Audrey Boyle. Um, I also am the host of Disrupt Education, a podcast that's been going on for about four or five years now. Raheen, you're on there. Uh, and uh, I look forward to having a few of uh, the other uh, panelists on there as well. Um, and um, I teach business education in uh, a system here in Chicago. Uh, and um, I love playing around in the system, getting your hands dirty, um, changing things up um, and just like Kyle, Tom, and, and Nyla, all the, the project-based learning, um, empowering students is, is what we're playing around with. Um, I have the opportunity to have a stage of students in front of me uh, to listen to, to learn from, <clears throat> and, uh, and to build with um, uh, curriculum. So as a business educator, I have those opportunities. So it's, it's great to be here and share some of the uh, experiences that I've had. Amazing. So nice to have you on. And I think, yes, this panel, some of the people in the panel would be amazing guests on Disrupt Ed Education. It was an amazing podcast with you. And now comes to never the least, uh, Heidi Little Newhouse, who, by the way, is organizing this Global Diff Action with me. So she's sort of like my partner in peace, not crying, but yeah. Go ahead with a brief introduction. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, so that's great to hear. And I appreciate everything that I'm hearing from everybody right now. I'm one of those who started with what we now call social emotional learning in 93. And so I was always the odd duck. I was the woman who came in to teach people how to love themselves. I was the woman who came in to teach people how to work together in the classroom and to unite. You know, now we have a title. So I went ahead and created the Center for Advancement in Social Emotional Learning. And so we are uh, actively um, flowing out eight modules on embodiment practices, tools, and techniques to help people connect with their hearts and to understand how to work in relation to self, family, community, and the world. So it's International Children's Month, which is June. It's our ninth year. It's a 365 day a year free thematic activity platform for the world to partake in. It's a uh, common source, public domain, um, people can go ahead and do whatever they wish with it. Uh, and we welcome people's love, care, and respect for all the children on earth, which is our mission. Right, Raheen? Yay. And so Raheen's fantastic. And I hope she'll tell everybody also about um, what she's doing right now because it's really cool. And then I look forward to exploring with everybody how do we build a world that works for all because I'm, I'm refreshed to be with you. Um, we're here. This is it. It's happening. It's amazing. Raheen? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, and well, yeah, I'm just gonna tell like a little bit of myself. Uh, so my name is Raheen, I am 13 years old. I'm a stand-up comedian, a writer, an entrepreneur, a launcher teacher, an interviewer, a theater actress, and now I also work on child rights and peace. So that is what I do, and I want to empower everybody around me, get us to their race, their religion, their caste, or their creed. Um, and I mean, I see all of you guys here, and you guys just introduce yourself, and it's just like, you know, I know amazing you guys are, and it's just like, it's just like a refreshment of that. And all of you guys who have been working in education or in Laila Umulu, I mean, I feel like how she's been educated and how she utilized that into the real world is a real, is the real thing to utilize what you've learned into actual practical things and into your passion and feel your passion that way. What do you guys think is the future of education? Nile Malou. The future of classrooms, so sorry. Yeah, um, so, oh, the, 
big question uh, to unpack, but I honestly think, and I think Peter touched on it a little bit, is just like project-based learning. That's that's what I envision for the future of education. Um, because right now, if we look at tests, it's like a bunch of people are cramming the night before, just memorizing information. They regurgitate it on the next on the test the next day, and then like one week later, they forget everything. And that's not really effective. It's not effective for their learning. And maybe they get like a good grade on that, but is that really worth something like five years down the line? And so I think instead, um, like the, the school systems are gonna look different without tests. Personally, I think that they're really like tests are not the most effective uh, way of testing your learning. Instead, uh, I think if you're actually building projects, that is just a much, much better way to approach learning. So, for example, if you do a biology unit with ecosystems, instead of having a test on that, maybe um, it's more open ended of a project that is actually there to optimize your learning. Um, so, for example, maybe you're really into ducks and you do something with the ecosystem of ducks, you present your research. Uh, and then instead of there just being one right answer, it's more open-ended and that's how it is in the real world. Uh, there's not just gonna be an answer handed to you. You have to be able to have the ability to figure it out. Uh, and it's not one size fits all, which is how a lot of the time school, school is just one size fits all. But if instead you approach it with projects, then I think that changes altogether. So so projects is the, the, the key, the key to, to education. Amazing. Yeah, I feel that too. Uh, and so now I'm going to lose things and envisions as PBL as a future of our classroom. Kyle Wagner, what do you think is the future of the classroom? Uh, ditto. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. elaborate a little bit um, on what Nyla Natalie said, first of all, I think that's that's spot on. I actually like the question more of the future of learning and uh, rather than the future of education, because I think a lot of times we envision education as being, you know, kids sitting in a classroom and sometimes we envision that as being a very innovative classroom. But I think we've seen, you know, with students being able to learn virtually uh, in hybrid modes. Uh, there's a lot more learning that's just happening in a school. And, you know, I. Uh, I just got exposed to Montessori, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a little bit of a, uh, of a turn away from project-based learning, even though that's my MO. Um, I got exposed to Montessori classroom these past two years and watching the way in which the students pretty much guided and directed their own learning. They, they decided which projects, which uh, extensions, which activities that they were going to, to further. Um, I watched students building, you know, urban gardens. I watched them uh, taking care of the classroom routines. I watched older peers teaching younger peers, you know, and this was all self-initiated by the students themselves. And the teacher goes through a, a very extensive training of two to three years just to be able to step back and take that facilitator role. So I really kind of see the future of learning as being very self-directed, self-initiated. I think you, uh, Raheen and Nyla are perfect examples of what happens when students take initiative for their learning. I mean, you've got your podcast, Nyla has started a lab and she probably knows more about blockchain than I do. And <laughs> I, uh, I think the future of learning is really self-directed and to empower students to be self-directed, Nyla is right on that you need a lot of projects and self-directed experiences to guide students and you can slowly pull the leash away and let them pretty much direct their own learning and um, teachers will, will really become facilitators of those learning experiences rather than the, the dictators of curriculum or content. Yeah, I mean, I think you're really getting me because that was what my next question was about. But I'm gonna come uh, onto that after we have all the thoughts on the future of the classroom. So I thought, Mark, what do you think is the future of the classroom? If you ask me what I think the future of the classroom is, I don't think it has a future. The classroom is going somewhere else. So that's not really the issue. The classroom is going to look totally different in 25 years. It's not going to look like a place with four walls where you sequester young people for six hours a day. That isn't going to happen. Uh, I'd also say that if we were just having dealing with you, Rahin and Nela, as the folks to be educated, we wouldn't actually need a future of education. You guys are doing just fine. And But the trouble is we have 1.8 billion young people between the ages of 12 and 24 on the planet. 
So one aspect I would say, we need a system of learning that actually allows for a lot more of people like the two of you. And somehow we're not doing that. We're missing human potential. We're just not striking the right chord with young people. So one future is to unfold young people and talents. Second thing I would say is that if the future was going to be somewhat uh, tranquil, then we would say, I would say, yes, we're just looking at more project-based learning. I've been, some people call me the father of project-based learning. I'm like Kyle, it's my MO for sure. That's sort of how I've made my living and done my thing for over 30 years. But I actually sort of agree with Kyle that we're sort of, we're going towards some other version of project-based learning. I actually call it a project mindset because I am interested in moving the focus from teacher-directed projects to young people taking charge of their learning as, as Kyle just uh, described so well. So we're actually going to, I think, incorporate some of this Montessori and many other things into project-based learning as we go forward. And the third thing I say is that the future isn't going to be tranquil. So somehow what we have to do is move the focus from quadratic equations and the water cycle to sustainable development goals and meaningful community involvement and engaging in the issues of the day because the issues of the day, if we don't turn those 1.8 million, uh, billion, excuse me, young people loose on those issues of the day, we're not gonna be able to handle them. We need that talent pool to really help us solve these issues. And obviously the two of you are contributing to that, but there's a whole lot of your peers out there who are not having that opportunity. So one part of the future is how do we do that? Those are my thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much. Th th I mean, yes, that is, you are the PBL guru as I, I would like to say that. So uh, yeah. And what about you, Peter Hostrasser? What do you think is the future of our classroom? If there is any future. Yeah, now, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, my question. Yeah, I'm gonna jump into Kyle's answer, ditto. Um, I think that um, a lot of what has been said here uh, put together is, is the idea of the classroom or lack thereof. I, this will not be an easy transition, like Tom's saying. I, I think this is already, this year is gonna be very, especially in the States and worldwide, we're, we're taking a look at people who wanna move and change this thing because we know the inequities we know of all the things that are that are troubling to where we are not allowing students to be like uh, you two young people here um, and doing amazing things I um, in in a lot of my podcasts, a lot of things I hear is community uh, and learning happening together. Um, I think uh, there, there's, there was a power structure of, uh, especially here in the States of education created by people who look like me. And I held the knowledge as an educator, and this might be going into roles a little bit as educators, but now the, the knowledge is out there. Um, teachers are no, I don't like the term teacher anymore. I think it's completely outdated. I think that we are coaches, we are mentors, we are people here to help you be what you want to be, um, guide you, give you advice, connect you with people, connect you with your community, listen, understand and learn um, and be a teammate uh, in this. Um, so in, in that sense, the, the roles are completely changing uh, or, or will be changed. Um, because I have students sitting in my class, they know exactly what I'm going to talk about if I was to spill them curriculum. So we have different kinds of discussions. Uh, and the environment, um, the environments, um, like Tom said, this is not going to be a place where we just house people in, in a room or in a building. Um, we need to be have people interacting with their communities, their local communities. That's the only way you make local communities better is, is you know, I can't go into a community and say, this is what you need. I'm the teacher. Uh, I need to listen. I need to, to work and, and expose all different kinds of things that I understand and then also learn uh, with students, young people, um, because that's how you better communities. And, and I think, yeah, like it's not education, it's, it's learning, it's growing, it's, it's becoming a better place overall. Um, and then the final thing I think in, in the pandemic that, that I see is this is not everybody's looking at, you know, in the States here, at least, and this might be naive of me because we learned so much about the world um, through this last uh, year, 
is we're not always just looking at Finland. <laughs> okay, it's not just Finland, it's all across the world. And there's some amazing things going on. And I think we've all exposed those things here. Um, and are exposing those things. And that is uh, something that the the learning environment is now not it doesn't have to just be your your local community, which it can be um, if, the, if the students choose that, but it can be worldwide as well to make uh, and learn from each other. Um, it's becoming a smaller place. Yeah, that's true. I appreciate your answer. Uh, and what about you, Heidi? What do you think is the future of the classroom? Well, I made a global classroom nine years ago that was a platform for people to use their voices and empowerment. The whole purpose was we had like peace concert, peace contests and art contests for kids and that was it, right? And I was like, well, I know they have a lot more to offer and a lot more to say. So that's why we built International Children's One so they would have a place to speak from and, and say from. So. You know, Jamie Margolin from This Is Zero Hour has gone from being a 12 year old working with Chutescott Martinez with the Earth Guardians to running a huge major environmental organization. Chutescott Martinez went from very humble beginnings to running Earth Guardians chapters all over the world. You know, it's 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 being done. And then, of course, my whole bag is self love. If we love ourselves and we actually give people room to cultivate their inner guidance system and who they are as people and give them space safe and brave space to do that, which is my whole role now after we got the kids, the children all like empowered and out in the world. And I'm not saying I'm the only one who did that. It took all of us, all the good parents, all the great relatives, everybody involved. Now I want to empower the educators to love themselves so they can be the embodiment of that. And then when they're out there modeling in the public systems, they can model what it looks like to love care and respect yourself and each other so and project-based learning absolutely i've got a play called one love rising that's all social emotional learning breaking the fourth wall where everybody breathes together and imagines together and you know like let's build something and it's just a skeletal structure so that everyone can decide who the characters are and what the positions are and how it all works together so i think giving a bit of a baseline is important because people are confused and they're not sure exactly what to do right now. So if we give some kind of baseline, like a, just like a loose framework or, you know, something, and then people can decide if they're into that. And then, you know, like the project, right? Like, oh, well, how about we just cultivate, you know, love in action? What is that? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it do? Then it gives people a framework so that they know what they're working within. Because if there's no framework at all, it can be scary and hard, you know, and it's already scary and hard for a lot of people. So I think as educators agree with all of you and everything you said, every single one of you, brilliant. I'm honored to be here. So thanks. Thanks for asking, Raheen. Yeah, it's, it's so nice to have you on and love your answer. Now, I, what I personally think is definitely my post-school and then also personalized education. Now, I got a scholarship for the School of Humanities summer school program. And it's amazing, you know, there's learning paths and then there's so many different things that you can pick up and then there's personalized that experience of education according to your needs and what you want to learn and your interests and the basic things. I think it is a whole blend of all. So personalized education as well as micro schools, what I think is the future of the classroom, though I am seriously rethinking my question of putting the classroom there. But nonetheless. Well, Raheem, the classroom could be the forest. It could be the kitchen table. It can be, you know, your car. It can be the movie theater. I mean, I see everything as a classroom, right? Like every single play, we're all learning and growing here. I use every moment I possibly can to educate my children who are around me in every way about everything. Like, isn't like the whole world is a stage? Okay, the whole world is a classroom too, right? Like, let's get real here. We're all learning every single second of the day, right? So it's like, I think the classroom is everything, all that is. Let's grow for it. Yeah, that is true. Now, one thing else that I that I truly feel is now at this point in time, you know, uh, first before this time, it was that oh my God, so you would first go to school, and so 
a few years ago, first you'd go to school and then you'd revise and you'd study more at home. But now it is you watch the video first, then your teacher is just a facilitator. At this point in time, the tables are really turned. I mean, uh, my math teacher, he would recommend this YouTube channels and would be like, okay, I'm there in the class. You guys watch the video and we're good to go for the day. So see this how the tables have turned. It's just, you know, how it is, how fast we are evolving with how teachers are becoming facilitated. And that's what Kyle was sort of pointing at when it was our last question. So what do you think is the future of teaching, coaching, mentoring, facilitating, whatever word you prefer term? Um, and what do you think would, it, would be the perfect or how would be the perfect teacher, mentor, coach of the future? So first let's go with Nyla Malou and then we could sort of rotate with how we already are. Yeah, cool. Um, so again, I think it's less like teachers and, and more like mentors. I think somebody said this, um, but less like micromanaging and more just trying to get them to develop their own passions. And so putting a lot more emphasis on real world skills, for example, projects are one of those, uh, like learning how to actually do critical thinking, but there's also learning about finances, you know, paying your bills, paying taxes, public speaking, you know, giving those opportunities to your students uh, and putting them, this may not, this may sound bad, but like putting them in more positions to, to fail uh, because, you know, you need to learn how to fail and get up from that because failure is a really big part of life. And it's something that's looked down upon within school systems. And yet failure is also really key to success. So for example, if you want to address one of the world's biggest problems, if you want to play a role in ending world hunger uh, and you're trying to create a product, there's going to be failure. And that is not going to be, you know, you come up with something, it solves world hunger in one hour. There you go. Um, there's like this need for instant gratification within students because they think failure is bad and they want, you know, success right away. But that's not how it's going to be. Uh, and so I think just changing the entire narrative around failure is going to do wonders for students uh, and just changing the mindset altogether. Yeah, I'm really loving it because I recall a lot of stories when some of my friends or I got, you know, I, I didn't fail, but then it's like very low marks. And there, there's always a look on their face that kills you inside. Trust me, it does. This is that stern look. But, you know, I feel like that is true, putting them in such positions that they can learn to get themselves up and prepare them for failure in life because that, that's going to happen in, at some point and the later it does the more you know you don't know about it or you have an experience about it the more you dread it or either the more it you think your life is over so uh yeah that is that is very nice uh what about you kyle uh all right yeah thanks for that input Nyla, I think uh, I think failure is is quite important. Um, I would push back also by just asking us to all consider too how we're evaluated as teachers and how we're evaluated as students. We're a evaluated students generally through standardized tests. We're judged by our GPAs, um, and so it is. On one hand, we're saying fail, fail fast, fail forward. Be at our evaluation system doesn't value failure. So I think one of the things we have to first change is how we're evaluating students and how we're evaluating teachers. So teachers, you know, can't be punitively evaluated by how well their kids do on standardized tests, how much of their curriculum that they cover, um, and what page are on in the textbook, you know, that needs to change. Um, students can't be evaluated by their standardized test scores, or by their GPAs. So I think a more holistic evaluation system so that students are developing a lot of these skills and they're able to showcase, yes, I've had this failure, but it's also led me to this growth and this success. So as you mentioned, world hunger, right? So what, what was the very first action that was taken towards world hunger? Was it looking just within your own community and looking at you know, a food bank and trying to you know, feed more people within your own community and doing that more sustainably? And if you have that long-term ability as a student to be able to develop that project, 
and you have a portfolio that is demonstrating your growth through that, and your evaluation system is more about your perseverance, your resilience, your innovation, your creativity, then therefore that benchmark is going to be a lot better um, to, you know, to demonstrate really what you are capable of as a student. So I think we need to change the evaluation systems. I see the futures changing those first, then equipping teachers with the skills to be able make that shift from the sage on the stage to really the guide on the side and being a mentor. And then I think the, the mindsets will start be, being built into students um, that the people who are held up on this pedestal are not the ones who got the A the quickest, but really who, who have persevered through a problem and a project in solving that. Amazing. That was, that was really like white on. Um, and what about you, Sir Thong? I'll touch on a couple of things here. Uh, I really like what uh, Peter, you said about uh, mentors. There's nothing wrong with the term mentor, facilitator, coach. That's clearly the direction we're going. But I also think there's something out there that we haven't yet quite touched upon enough. And that is, and I, I, this is bad news for Rahina and Naila, but we don't know what we're doing as adults. We don't know what the future holds. And it's very difficult to actually become a coach and mentor if you don't know what the future holds yourself. So I actually moving more towards the, the, the term or the vision of teacher as co-learner. In other words, we're sort of all entering this process together. Peter sort of referred to that, a process of creating a future together with a lot of unknowns in front of us. Now that doesn't mean you can't as a teacher be a mentor or an expert even. You have life experience to share hopefully as an adult with a younger person. So it doesn't negate that entirely, it just, says, I don't know exactly what we're doing. And we're moving through this very new future together. We have dropped off a cliff essentially. And as we drop off this cliff, we're in free fall to some extent, and we're all trying to figure out how we're gonna fly. And uh, as they, the old saying goes, we are building the plane in the middle of the air. And so we're doing that together. So the co-learner is very important. I just like to say one other thing that sort of also Peter, you touched upon, we still have a very westernized view of learning. I mean, in Peter's terms, it's what the University of Chicago thought we should all know. <laughs> and, and really, I want to know what the world is thinking, because we have a whole lot of indigenous knowledge out there that we have not even begun to talk, talk about who don't care about standardized tests and don't measure their learning through that methodology. So Raheem, to kind of go home with you. I'm, I'm, you've had a very westernized form of learning. And even though I don't know whether you're in Islamabad or Lahore, or wherever your hometown is, but I want to know about how much your countrymen up in the North Mountains, uh, you know, I want to know what all of them are thinking and how do we bring them into a world vision of learning? Because right now we're still operating from that Western perspective. And uh, I think we're trying to let go of that. It's, it's, we see this in the news. We know we're trying to disassemble of that, but I think we more conscious we can that we're trying to be really inclusive. And I, by inclusive, I, I, to me, there's no use of trying to be, invite everybody into the existing classroom for what? We need a new kind of classroom. <laughs> so anyway, that's some thoughts about that. And as far as the virtual and the project-based learning, I think all that is just going to happen. We could have a conversation about how virtual learning works or doesn't work because we have learned a tremendous amount in the last 15 months about actually what engages young people in a virtual environment or at the same time causes them to disappear for six months and never showing up on the zoom room for the teacher and there's some really issues around that we learned a lot about what it means to engage and how to do that and that is really a project-based world so those are some of my thoughts right yeah yeah, I mean, you're very right, and it is very scary to know, oh my God, so first we're told grown-ups know everything, and now we're like, they don't know anything, so it is scary, but I mean, it is true, the free fall thing you said is, is correct, it is a bit scary, but it is, so we're figuring out everything together, which is interesting, and that's what makes life, life interesting, you know, just that mystery and that curiosity and that scary scary things uh so what about you peter very excited to uh just see what you have your mind on and your thoughts on this 
Yeah, there's there's so much that was covered and 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 before that it's it's amazing. Uh, Kyle, I'm going to go with, you know, talking about how teachers are evaluated. Again, we are looking at, like you're saying, Tom, the, the Western look and uh, the five E's and everything that University of Chicago wants everybody to do, which is hilarious if you're not familiar. Um, but uh, there is a book that's written by Craig Randall. I'm going to give him a shout out. It's called Trust Based Observations. And, and it's a very it's a great book. Um, and, and I've talked to Craig and he's worldwide as well, kind of like you, Kyle, going across the world and learning. Um, and, and it's pretty it's so basic. It's it's almost like, why not? Why are we not doing this? So it's just a couple of questions. I'll, I'll let you all look into that. Um, but I think you're right. Um, when when us as educators are looking at different models, uh, you know, the, the Danielson model and, and everything is just like, we have to do this and you have to do that. And there's 45,000 check marks. You really don't have time to be a human. Um, and that kind of goes along with uh, what Heidi Year's talking about with the social emotional, um, you know, learning, um, which is now becoming and finally i'm i'm guessing you're seeing it now uh, the years that you've worked on it it is very important um we have to understand students as humans but to teach a student first not the subject um uh, or learn with the, the the student so um and and i think kyle you mentioned it as well as a little bit of portfolio um i think credentials are okay um i think it's it's an outdated system uh i think okay you can get the check mark or the certificate but i i know uh, a lot of people with check marks and certificate that uh, you know i wouldn't trust with any of my money in a, in a business or job or changing the world so uh i am a huge advocate of value-based portfolios what what is your value what do, what do you do well right whether you're in the mountains of pakistan or whether you're in hong kong or what what do you do well and let's grow that right let's go let's because now you can become a part of a powerful team uh, of people in whatever capacity that you want using your interests using your skill sets i think in education especially in the western model what we do is we look at what you're bad at and then we shove about three or four more classes down your throat to try to fix it um and that obviously does not work it creates all kinds of problems uh you know physical mental a lot of damaging things that are that are happening here so i really like um, um building portfolios um when i, I was a, an administrator in um, the western burbs here before i just went back into teaching uh into the having fun in the classroom but um and uh there were there were six things that that they were looking at the district was looking at they didn't know how to do it to your point tom we we don't know what we're doing uh but we're failing in front of people but i they came up with six pretty cool things it was being self-empowered being a communicator somebody who thinks critically which is obviously no one knows exactly what that means ever uh embracing diversity uh being a creator and a collaborator and okay we'll start there and then start with your skills and and how do you as a person do that rather than you know you get an a on a math test or, or whatever so that's kind of the way i see it uh, as well and, and don thank you so much because i truly i love teaching in a in a place where there are four generations of people and you're right what i have certain experiences but it's not going to look like the experience i mean if you can imagine what you know my grandparents went through is not even close to what I went through. So how do we know what's what's happening next um, with the youth? So uh, I, I like the co-learning uh, piece as well. Yeah, that is that is true. Because at this point in time, I feel like um, a lot of people that I interview and a lot of people that I talk to, uh, they're always like, if they're educators, now it's like we learn from them as well. And a lot of times more from them because I saw my teachers in Zoom and they're like, Wait, so how do I do that? Uh, how do I do that? It's that one thing that we know, that social media, different things, especially technology, one thing that we do know, uh, that is that. So yes, it is. if it is a co-learning environment, it is a rather healthy one, so that there is not that, oh my God, I'm the teacher, I'm in control, and I'll do anything I want. So yeah, I come more onto what I have to say about it, but first, let's go with Heidi. Um, Heidi, what do, you, what do you have to think about it? 
Well, I feel like I'm in triage. I feel like I have one hand on the heart, one hand on the vein, people are ripped to pieces and I'm going, okay, wait, wait, wait how do we stop the bleed? <laughs> Let's not bleed out here, you know? So it's like, that's how I feel. And, um, and I know without any doubt that it all comes back to the heart and bleeding with the heart and getting people connected to themselves. And I guess I sound like a broken record because I have for 28, 9, 30 years now, same thing, you know, it all comes back to the same thing. How do we, um, how do we find their most unique and beautiful gifts? Where are the new Teslas, the new Einsteins? Where are the new Gandhis? Who are these people we're surrounded with? And why do we think even for a second that we should have them sit someplace, shut up, be quiet, um, absolute com compliance, complacency? You know, I mean, it's ludicrous to, to, to put anyone's child in a space where they don't get to be creative. We are creative beings. That is our job here. That's what we are created to do. Our cells are always dividing every multi-second, you know? So it's like Stanislavski said it best, and, uh, and then I'll quote Gandhi, and then I'll be done. But Stanislavski said that the root of prejudice is actually foisting our opinion on others when they're in the creative process. So if you think of that in relation to all of what we've done to other cultures and everything else, those people, they didn't love themselves in the first place. And that's why they hurt other people. So hello, let's get to the stem here of where the bleed is. And then from there, uh, Gandhi said, um, we have spent uh, decades and centuries educating the mind, decades and centuries training the body, and we have allowed the heart to atrophy. I call out to you as educators, as mentors, as guides, as parents, help with the heart, lead them to their heart. And when I read that, that was it. My whole life was, oh yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing my master's work on, my dissertation. I fought to prove self-love and education with a board of people. You guys all know how, what it's like with your master's degrees. You have to fight to prove and to prove that love is important, oh gosh, I wanted to tear my hair out. It was terrible, but you know, we did it, I got it done and then here it is. So now let's reach everybody, you know, let's reach everybody and get them connected to their heart. And then when they're connected to their heart, then they can do projects and they'll feel confident standing up and sharing themselves in front of people. And you know how many times I failed? Every single day, 25 times a day, seriously. Like to actually get anything relatively important done, you're going to get people who have no idea what you're talking about. You're going to get people who don't understand you. You're going to have to stand in that place where nobody really knows what you're talking about until they finally get an inkling. Because they say the average person takes seven to 14 times in marketing to actually hear or see something that has come across the table for them. It's seven to 14 times. That's a lot of times to have to repeat yourself. So I'm used to feeling like a broken record at this point, but at least now the world is reflecting something back to me that makes sense, right? Like let's care for things and take care of people. And there was always that, but it should be common, you know, like it should be common to love, care and respect children and to take care of them. And we're going to go through a period here in the next year where it's pretty shameful with the residential schools. And I mean, look at, want to give schools a bad name? Just take a look at what's happening right now with that. I mean, they were allowed to do whatever they wanted to those children. And, you know, it's like parental involvement, guardian involvement, getting the community and the families involved. And, you know, God bless me with this, but, you know, our infrastructure of public systems, it's time to flow and move with the times and what needs to happen right for people you guys are giving me empowerment here because you know it's not easy knocking on district doors you know and saying oh hi i'm here and we have self-love okay like <laughs> you should see the eyeballs that have rolled at me over the years teaching people to connect to their hearts but that's okay we do it anyway right because we know it's right right we do the progressive education because we know it's right and for people like um N nayla is that how you say your name is nayla, nayla? Uh, it's nyla nyla it's beautiful and i love you thank you for doing what you're doing in the world and for being empowered and standing in your truth you know that's what we want we want people 
young people to stand in their truth and to have the confidence and know they're supported to do that. So any blessings? Yes. Um, so, I mean, what I have to say is this, and what you said, Heidi, really resonated, like, yeah, thank God you have your silky, beautiful hair and you went through all of that. You did not rip them out. So, <laughs> coming back. <laughs> You're to, awesome. She's like the ultimate connector, empowered lover, and it's because her dad is behind her totally a thousand percent. And she works with uh, grown-ups like us, adults like us, who are embracing our inner child and can extend, right, the empowerment to others. It's huge. Every one of you has done the work. Thank you. Yeah. And today, me and Heidi have been friends for a year because last year, exactly today, I did a session with her. So that was the first time that we met. So congratulations to us. Uh, and now my question is, how do you think the curriculum is changing? It's probably changing. Uh, and what do you think is the future of the curriculum? Keeping in mind of how do you think will technology be incorporated into the curriculum? Let's go with that. Uh, let's go with Carl Wagner. What do you think? I feel like it's unfair. You're always calling me first. I think we should give, <laughs> you can call on me what? later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Peter, what about you? You're always happy. Yeah, the, yeah, curriculum I think is, is, is an interesting thing. Um, we, I think Tom mentioned it before, we've, we have this curriculum that is the core four or the westernized. It's the same thing over and over and over and over again. Um, and again, it's not human centric. It's not, it's just here it is. And, and we're going to grade you on that. Um, I think it's, it's a necessity that the curriculum becomes uh, how to make the world a better place. I mean, and not necessarily the entire world, the, the immediate world um, of, of where people are. Um, we always say you need to meet your students where they are. Well, the curriculum needs to be the where the students are and what what they're dealing with. Um, I've worked in several different schools here in the States and very different. Um, I think Heidi, you, you talked a little bit about how, you know, districts are very different. Um, there is a lot of different social economics, a lot of racial, a lot of isms across the board. And um, for me to come into a district and be a person um, who is the minority in that district, um, and then you learn, you learn that they, those core four are applicable, but not even close the way that we're, we're teaching them or the, the system uh, in the westernized world is teaching them. So, um, you know, again, like as a business educator, I have that opportunity to figure out, okay, you know, most students were, they did want financial literacy. They did want to understand how, do, how can I make ends meet for my family? Um, where do I go to get a loan? I mean, how, how can I, how can I, you know, afford whatever they need to afford and the basics and, and different things like that. Um, and, and then that needs to become the curriculum, in my opinion, um, we need, we need to raise people up into where they are. Um, but in order to do that, like Heidi said, we need to understand who they are. So the curriculum really is humanistic first mm -hmm. it's teaching those students. Um, so that's the way I see it. It's out of necessity. It, it is out of um, interest and, and how people see the world uh, because you all have amazing, amazing opportunities to bring and, and ideas. We're doing this right here. And, and Raheen, you, you help put this together. I mean, this, this is an example of a necessity. Let's, let's start talking about this and you've created this and that's how we're using technology. And uh, using technology as a, as a positive, um, I think, uh, as what we're doing there, there's a lot to learn and we can't be afraid of it. I think we need to embrace it and fail with it, but then have the support underneath it as well. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. Sorry, there's somebody at the door going crazy. Uh, and I mean, I, I totally think about the Western perspective, which I forgot to speak about, but it is it is true and you know at this point in time at least in pakistan or the school that i was i was going to when it is something from the west it's just cool that's 
that's what parents are paying for, for the Western perspective or for the Western studies or for the Western things to be taught. And for the Pakistani things, it's, it's in government schools, it's in, it's in public schools. Every private school, they're always about, oh, so you're gonna teach my child English or you're gonna speak in English or you're gonna you know, uh, do everything right up to the university level. We go to, you know, so there's gonna be Western case studies and there's gonna be Western this. Everybody is just stoked about the fact that it is from there. And we really, at times, you know, lose the fact that we need to appreciate what we have and the ancestral knowledge that we have and that we can utilize um, our people and people's knowledge to know more and to create a world that works for all. See how I did that? But uh, please, let's come on to Kyle Wagner. Are you ready or should I go on to somebody else? I'm ready. Well, Kyle's probably ready too. Go ahead, Kyle. Um, on, you know, you go. I, I want to be later on because I, I thought there time. He wants to, yeah. You know, Kyle likes to follow up and end everything, so that's fine. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Listen, I'm going to I'm going to tie a few things together here. Uh, I just sent uh, Heidi and I are having a small side chat on the heart, which I totally agree on. But I I have permission from you, Raheem. This is the future of learning, so we can go deep here. I think partly this future of learning includes figuring out the science of the whole child. Right now, we like to throw around the whole child, but we are very, very far from that because we are embedded in this cognitive model from the 1960s that says nothing really happens from the neck down that's important. And this has to change if we want to carry out this vision, because if you turn, you asked about what curriculum, curriculum is now the person. Knowledge is on YouTube. So we're really, the curriculum becomes how you develop young people. Now, that's a simplification. And, and someone like Nyla, who's obviously got a lot of technical information that you've had available to you, I don't say that, I don't mean to say that that technical information isn't available or shouldn't be available in a curriculum. I'm just saying in, a, in the simplest terms, it's people who are at the forefront now and knowledge is secondary. I mean, 80% of young people go to UQ2 for, to find out the answer to a question. So if we're gonna really make that a reality, then we've got to examine this whole sort of uh, physiological model we have, if you will, because the heart and brain work together. It's like Heidi said, and the heart is not just some sort of mythical thing where it's not a Hallmark card. It's actually a science that helps us learn and is, connects us to the brain. 80% of their nervous impulses between heart and brain go from heart to brain, not the reverse. That should tell us right there that we need a whole person version of physiology to back up the whole child. I heard Peter reference the whole child earlier in the broadcast. So I think we're all on kind of the same page here. What does it mean to have a whole child? And we're not really don't have a science that backs us up right now. I have a lot of complaints about neuroscience and a lot of assumptions are made by today's neuroscientists and cognitive scientists who then drive our curriculum, which I think are incorrect. And I'll just throw out something. If we're gonna figure out the feature of learning, we better have a little better insight in what actually the mind is, which is a term we use 20,000 times a day in education and have absolutely no idea what we're talking about. Oh, we're gonna improve the minds. Well, what are we doing? Well, we don't know. So I'm just saying, let's maybe the future of learning might start with some honesty on the part of the establishment that we're a bit at sea here. That's my thought. So I'll turn that over to Kyle and he can do something with that. <laughs> All right. Is it my turn, Raheem, to do something with like that? Or you, do you want to? No, you no, go, no. Next. go ahead, Kyle. I'll go next. Um, okay. Yeah, that, Tom, you, you pretty much covered everything I wanted to mention. I think, though, you gave a better tweet. I, I wrote it down. Learning from the heart is not a Hallmark card. It's a scientific process. Um, I'm definitely going to be tweeting that out later. Uh, but, yeah, the, 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 really the merging, I think the curriculum is a merging of the three essential components 
of learning. It's hands on, it's hearts on, right? And it's head on. So I think Tom is correct. Uh, you know, I think Peter's mentioned that as well when he talked about whole child and learning out of necessity. And it's more than just really the mind and just activating brains and all days, you know, spent just trying to activate people's brains and knowledge and then going into the world and not having any, really any skills to be able to integrate. Um, Cause I mean, here's another cliche, right? I mean, the jobs of the future, right? You're gonna hate, I'm say this, but it's true, right? I mean, what half the jobs of the future aren't jobs today. I mean, it's probably gonna be higher than that. So you're either gonna have AI that's gonna do it for you. Um, you know, or it's not going to be a job that exists anymore because it's become obsolete and there's a better process for it. So really the curriculum is not just a set of knowledge. I think really the curriculum is empowering young people with skills. I have put forth a proposition for what the future of curriculum could be. And I said it a few weeks back on LinkedIn, and I would love for someone to take me up on it. But I think it's centered around what uh, was mentioned earlier about making the world a better place. But I think the curriculum has been laid out through the SDG goals, the standalone development goals that have been laid out that say exactly 17 different goals that touch on every single you know, issue that we're going to be facing as humans. From a scientific standpoint, from a humanity standpoint, it's transdisciplinary. It's making the world a better place. There's room for heart, head, and hand in it. There's room for learner and student agency. And you're not just working for yourself to discover your passions or interests. You're working to discover your passions and interests so that you literally can make the world a better place and reach the goals for humankind together collectively. And it's not just students working on it. It's teachers working right alongside students, facilitators rather. It's the community. It's embracing indigenous culture as well as the Western culture. And there it is. It's been laid out. Let's make that the curriculum. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, so nice that you put that. Um, and I mean, what I have to say is, you know, curriculum here, uh, the sort of things that my, or like even the books, you know, my dad studied with are still the same. I study from them. I mean, it is very weird because things have been happening since, well, I mean, he's a 42 year old man and I am 13 years old, do the math yourself. Um, and well, there is some difference, you know, of age. So coming back to what I was saying, is that when it's just the same and you're not updating and going with the time, then also with the perspective of how a child, I mean, not how a child works, but how a child is, how they would perceive or receive this knowledge that you're giving them and then also very much on how so the teacher teaches it or the teacher conveys the message from the whole education power to the child really does matter and really impact i mean sometimes i've seen that the curriculum is also amazing i see a, a lot of good things and then it's like but how was that taught was it amazing well let's just not say it was great so that there are my thoughts because i asked this question because i want to learn more about how it's changing how it's going to be that's why my answer is not the most well i don't i'm not qualified for curriculum and stuff what about you heidi um, i'm just sitting here in the background as the cheerleader to everything that i'm hearing going yes 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 and you know I spent the last five years creating eight modules, their guide to help people embody tools and techniques to connect to their heart, to their inner guidance systems. They're cultivating their dreams. What are their goals? It incorporates indigenous knowledge through the medicine wheel work and mind mapping. I mean, like we've hit on every single point now. Great. I am seeing a hundred thousand percent love and happiness from the adults and grownups, the educators, you know, that are, are, are experiencing it, going through the training and all that stuff. And, you know, now it's, it'll be also very curious to see what the youth think, you know, cause Dr. Emoto gave me a teaching back in the day before he transcended that connects to the heart. And then we share um, love with the water and receive, you know, energy back from the water. 
And the children really like that. It's a very beautiful thing to feel your energy as you cultivate the joy. And that's what we're going to do at 111 today. So you call, you you literally put your hands to your heart because we draw attention to the places we touch, right? So you literally put your hands to your heart. And then you imagine all of the beautiful things in your life, like the most beautiful things ever. The joy, the birthday parties, the grandmas, the, the anything. And you fill yourself all up with love. And then you send it out to the next time zone. And with Dr. Emoto, you send it to the water. You say, water, I love you. I thank you. I respect you. And then the water, you wait. And the water will literally give you energy back into your hands. And you can bring it to your heart. And it teaches and shares and shows. And you work with the activity of actually giving and receiving with the water. Try it in your bathtub with a bowl of water at a lake, a river, an ocean. It works. It's amazing. And it's always different. So, you know, let's see. Let's see, you know, because Raheem, you might shock me. You're going to take the module certifications. You might hate it as a youth. I have no idea what you're going to think because I know you guys come in all tuned, turned on, tapped into, and then like how much abuse does the person suffer, right? To make them feel like different inside of themselves. How much do they pick up in their environment that affects them in some way? You know, so this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing, and like we have like societal things going on right now, right? And they're like big things. And there's a lot of weapons in Hollywood. There's a lot of weapons in video games. You know, there's a lot of killing going on. There's a lot of, you know, it's okay to go beat somebody up and take them out of their car on a video game. I saw it the other day. To me, it's atrocious. I'm like, why are you doing this? Why are you playing this game? Ah, it's just pretend. Yeah, okay. But you don't think it actually is doing anything in your life? like to you or to the people around you, how can it not, right? So it's like just being really conscious about how we're moving forward, I suppose. And everybody in this room is outstanding. And I want to work with all of you. So I'll be in touch after our panel. <laughs> it's like you're all great. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. I mean, with the particular thing you said, so my brother, he, he's a fan of so many That's games. And I was like, oh, my God, I work on beats and this is what you're doing wow so ironic and then I, I i delete it every night and then he installs them again so there's a whole cycle that's been going on mm -hmm. but you know i'm sure that it does make an effect and this is the best that i can do um and what about you nyla it's like it's been so long since we heard nyla so give it up for her and what do you think how can or the certain expected the question that i'd like for you to answer is definitely how do you think technology could be incorporated into what we're learning and the curriculum? Oh, technology. Yeah, I think really everything is being like shifted to technology already. Um, so like in the past, like maybe COVID kind of accelerated that, but in the past, like, you know, writing tests on papers, for example, now we're doing pretty much everything online. Um, and there are like infinity amount of resources online like you can learn so so much but um there's also a lot of toxic things online so it's about like finding that balance and you know being able to actually educate yourself and get away from these distractions online um i agree in terms of like personalizing like people's education but something else i would say kind of putting a spin on your technology question um we actually need to put more emphasis on emerging technologies um that's not like on your computer but things like artificial intelligence and blockchain and nanotechnology and fusion energy a lot of people don't know about these these things that are going to be so heavily impacting their lives for example artificial intelligence uh, someone mentioned it, it it's going to be revolutionizing the future it already is uh it's going to be replacing jobs people don't know about it uh it, that's just an example of many different technologies we need to be more educated on these fronts um you know of course we need to learn about like the basics like sciences and math but we also need to know about these and that's also going to be a huge areas of work so if you don't know about these emerging technologies if you don't know how to code these are skills that you want to have for the future and it starts with exposure and then from exposure comes building these projects and building these projects are going to do um like they're going to help you have phenomenal impact to get those skills that are crucial uh to the future and so putting emphasis on these technologies is going to be really integral. Yeah, amazing, Nala. I, I, I totally feel you, though I will have to Google nanotech again, but 
I'm right there with you, sister. I remember the first time I talked to Niles, we went about about fusion energy. And the whole time I'm thinking, what is it? I'm trying to Google it and I, I, I still don't understand it. And then the first thing I asked her is, what is it? So, yeah, I, I'm more of like a basic, basic physics level right now. But amazing, right with you, sister, and right with you, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Please, let's start with the closing remarks. Hear from you guys and loved putting this together. It was fun with the emails and everything. But this, you know, this is some you know, total conversation, like an open dialogue here. So uh, let's start with Sam, your closing remarks, please. What would you like to say? So I'm going to end on a positive note here. Uh, I'm not a Pollyanna, but I am an optimist. And what I, I do think that on all these challenges, we're actually, as a globe, are making some amazingly fast progress. Just the past 24 months has, or 36 months, it's a small window of time. We have suddenly turned this conversation into a global conversation. That is a huge, huge advance in terms of trying to figure out where we're going educationally as a planet. So I think we ought to acknowledge the fact that we have made those connections. It's global. This conversation is evidence of that. There's plenty of other uh, instances where we can see this kind of progress. Secondly, I think we're in general starting to talk about the right things. Inclusion, indigenous, broadening out knowledge, whole person, all these are becoming part of the conversation. So let's uh, leave with a little pat on the back. We're doing okay and probably are making more progress in the last 10 years than the world education has made in at least 200 years. So we're doing okay. Yeah, Thank amazing. You. Thank you so much for being here. It was so amazing to have you on. What about you, Kyle? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll end on an optimistic note. Uh, I think we have made a lot of progress, which also starts with a P. And I think some memorable of uh, three Ps. You have passion. So as young people, as ourselves, I think once we find our passions, something that, you know, just makes us get up in the morning, something we can't wait to do. Seems like Nyla has found hers with emerging technologies. So find that passion, connect it to a purpose. And I think where those, those two things intersect, there's a line right in the middle and that's a project. So I think passion, purpose, find a project, meaningful projects to connect those two things. And uh, once we've done that, I think all the other things will, will fall into place. Beautiful. Thank you so much Kyle, for being here. And this was our first interaction. Just see how amazing it was. Uh, and what about you, Nyla? Yeah, I would kind of leave on the note um, of just however many people are, are listening, like regardless of your age, just keep learning. Um, there are so many resources available online. You know, we're really lucky to even have technology in front of us. So just taking advantage of that, you know, taking courses, watching videos, reading articles, there's so much to learn. Um, and so, yes, just, just keep learning, keep educating yourself. Thank you for having me. Amazing. So nice to have you on. Thank you so much for coming on. What about you, Peter? So uh, in 2017, I tweeted, and it's actually my post to tweet since we mentioned Twitter, um, outdated education standards uh, will remain the same until somebody challenges them. And of course, almost to the day uh, in 2021 um, or 2020, that, that happened. Um, and I, I think uh, as Kyle and Tom and, and Nyla are talking about, like, this is this is where we're going. Um, and at the beginning of this pandemic, I knew that this next school year was going to be the one where I was going to learn the most. I didn't say I was going to control teach or anything. I was going to learn the most. And it started generating this conversation uh, even more. And, and look what's come of it. Um, we do, we're going to fail forward. And, uh, and this is a, a definite turning point. And um, I'm, I'm also an optimist. And uh, that's why I'm always happy. Uh, but uh, it is going to be a tough road. Um, but uh, it's worth the fight and, and doing these things uh, are very important. So thank you for having me, Reen. Thank you so much for being here, Peter. You had an amazing 
perspective to share on all the questions and so did all of you guys. What about you, Heidi? Just sending lots of love to everybody and blessings for everyone finding their gifts and their calling here so they know what they're doing and purpose. And thank you for having me here with all of these wonderful people. I appreciate every one of you. It's amazing having you on and see what the power of technology is. Either I had to fly somewhere, either I had to fly him in, something like that needed to happen. And I believe that the future of education, seeing that there's so many things that are changing and that we see that how the betterment in education is gonna help us build a world that works for all in these open dialogues. The more we discuss, the more that there's, you know, sort of disagreements on certain things as well. There's arguments and then you start sort of building up on that, sort of understanding each other. Um, that is how we build the work for all. And that is how peace is used. That is what I think. Thank you so much for all of you guys for being here, giving the time though we were 15 minutes late. Uh, and for all of you guys for watching and I will be connected and we'll be coming back with this group inshallah soon as well. Thanks.